comes over and hurts you usually. If it's a greenish, bluish tone, you generally get fat. So what do you learn right away? You stay away from him when he's got the reddish tones, don't you? You hide from him. So about that time, you get turned loose in the space alien, he goes back up, and he's sitting around in a board meeting with a bunch of other space aliens. He said, what do you think about the human? You know, how's your test going? I said, well, I got this guy, boy, he dumb. Man, I, I, don't think, I don't think how humans could be the master of their earth, because this, this guy that I had, he was so stupid, I couldn't teach him the smartest thing. Either that, or he was so smart, he was trying to get me just by taking advantage of playing games with me. He didn't mind getting hurt. I don't know what's going on. But he said, it was really bizarre. What I found out was they had 40 some odd bathrooms at this place that I had my human locked in. I discovered a human goes in these bathrooms all the time. I noticed a couple of them right near where I landed my spaceship had a door that was painted red. The rest of them were all painted other colors. And so I just made an arbitrary rule. I'm going to teach my human that he cannot go into the bathroom with a red door. And I put a little wire on it so when he had opened it, I could tell he was opening it. So when I come down to feed him, I, I first thing I do is look at those two bathrooms. If he'd been there, I give him a correction. But if he hadn't been in there, I give him his food, just like usual. He says, you know, the funny thing, he said, I thought the human was learning, because to this day, I have to say the human knew exactly what he was doing wrong. He said, well, I thought, what do you mean? Well, when I'd come and he'd been into that bathroom with the red door, he'd run hide from it, because he knew he was going to get a correction. So he knew was, he was wrong, but why did he do it? You know, he still goes and does the <laughs> same thing. I don't understand what's wrong. You know, he never learned. Either that or he likes to get hurt. I don't know what's wrong, but I, he never took care of what's going on. Okay. My question to you folks is, what went wrong? What did that space area need to do differently to make you learn not to go into that bathroom with the red door? You need to correct him when he went in the bathroom instead of waiting. Okay, you had to get him when he went in. Okay, Dr. Craig down at Lackland Air Force Base, in the early days, I guess it was about 20 years ago now, took a bunch of our taxpayers' money and did a study on this. They want to determine how much time could elapse between cause and effect and have the dog still learn. The scientific results of this study was one and three tenths seconds of 750 dogs study. In other words, it either happens within a second or the animal will make a connection. Dr. Craig said after he did that, he was a college boy just getting out of uh, veterinary school, got drafted, and uh, was not very popular because he got all these career officers training dogs down there and they you know, get rid of this guy, you know, he's interfering with what we're doing. So he said just to save face, he invited informally a bunch of humans and a bunch of these uh, trainers and said, let's test you guys. Mm -hmm. You think humans did better or worse? Probably worse. They did worse. Yeah. And the reason is because we have learned to communicate. We don't have to rely on our animal instincts to make a difference, uh, a connection between cause and effect. They came out with 0.86 seconds with the human. So what this means is in dealing with a dog, we've got to catch the dog in the act and whatever he's doing. And if we want him to continue doing it, we praise him or give him a positive motivation, which is praise, food, petting, playing ball, whatever. If we want him to quit, we give him a negative motivation which I can say to you guys in my classes, I said it's something uncomfortable, but it's pain. That's all it is. It's just pain. It's going to hurt. We're going to hurt the guy. That's all there is to it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's just that simple. And we're going to use a collar. We're going to use other, other methods to do that. Next question. How do you know if your correction or your negative reinforcement is truly a negative reinforcement. Anybody have an idea of how you could measure whether or not that was effective? The dog stops. Uh, right. He quits doing it. If he quits doing whatever it is, it alters his behavior. Yeah, if he alters his behavior, it was a negative reinforcement. I don't I think it'd be pretty hard to argue with this theory that I've given you so far because there's really no holes in it. it it's it's all such basic common theory, it's just that simple. But where you start screwing up is you start anthropomorphizing, which means you're reading your human emotions into this dog and you're making him into a little furry covered person that should understand everything you're saying. I've had fun with, with Orlando. I want to get him on tape before he leaves because 
he's taught me a bunch of Spanish words, and I can understand a few things he says every now and then. And I would be willing to wager money that I know more Spanish than any dog in this world. But if he started screaming at me in Spanish, I wouldn't know what he was saying. So how can you assume that somebody that Spaniard has trained, this dog that he's trained, is supposed to understand what he's done wrong when this person's run after screaming at him in Spanish? Does he really understand? It's really brought home to me when I was in Germany. I was watching one time a dog being held by the collar like this all the way across the field. And I, I said, what does the dog do wrong? What's going on? Can't you tell what he's saying? No, and I don't think the dog can either. You know, here the dog is really getting abused, and he doesn't know what he's done wrong. So communication really is our whole problem. That's why we've divided training up into teaching, showing the dog what we want him to do, and then training, making him do it on a consistent basis. If you can think of communication with the dog as being nonverbal, other than the fact that we are trying to teach the dog a verbal command, if you can just Think about not using words to teach that dog anything. You have to use body motion. You have to use a physical aspect. You can't say, please dog, sit. I'd really like for you to sit. You're going to have to make the dog sit and then reward him for that behavior in order for him to learn. Now this is one thing that's good in working with very beginning people. And, and I don't know, some of you probably do it in your obedience training. Teach them hand signals. Teach them. That means sit. Keep your mouth shut. Like this, you know. You, how many times can you say it? That means sit, that means sit. You know, you're changing the language so we're getting you away. The only reason we're doing it is to, to take you away from what is normal for you and get you into an abnormal thing because you're not going to communicate with hand signals. Now, let me give you an example or two and see how everybody's tracking. I'm going to start a year and we'll go through everybody. I want you guys to answer. Would you give the dog a negative motivation? Would you give the dog a positive motivation, or would you give the dog no motivation? Okay, remember, negative makes him quit doing things, positive makes him continue doing things. Real simple example. You're out barbecuing, you've got a bunch of friends over, you're drinking some beer, you're having a good time, your dog's loose in the backyard, you've got a whole pile of steaks on a table as you're throwing them on the grill, cooking them. And all of a sudden you want to pay much attention, you talk to somebody, you turn around, and here your dog is, he's stolen a steak, and now he's laying underneath this table, chewing on the steak. So when you turn around, saying, there he is underneath there, chewing on the steak. My question to you is positive, negative, or no motivation. Don't explain, just say which one of those three you pick. Off the top of my head, I would say negative. Okay. Yeah. I don't quite understand what you mean. Okay, negative, uh, by the motivation you mean or yeah okay negative motivation would be you do something to be painful for him something would be yeah with him whatever uh positive motivation would be you phrasing you know that was a good dog basically and none would be that he, you're not going to do anything to him right. pretend it didn't happen okay negative okay none negative none 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 none, none. okay now this gets to what we call problem identification what was the dog doing at the time that you had the choice of motivation? I'm going to switch to none. <laughs> <laughs> he was laying underneath the table, children. There's no, there's no association there. Feeling it's too late to, yeah, it's too late to correct the dog. Everybody understand, Ken? You understand why? Yeah. Um, you've got to catch him doing it. Now, I, you could say I trick you. I do it. It's no. straightforward. Right. But that's how hard training is. And we've got to do this all the time. We gotta, we gotta figure this out. We, it's really difficult. You've, you've been working real hard with your dog. You're getting him work. He's biting real good on the sleeve, real hard on the sleeve. Everything's fine. And you think, well, Tom, it's about time to teach him out. Yeah, okay, let's teach him out. So you go out there, you put a pinch collar on the dog. He's biting real good, and you go out, boom, like this, and you jerk him. Yep, he comes off the sleeve. What have you thought he would do? Quit biting. Quit biting. Him. Quit biting. Okay. Now, you taught him to bite. How'd you teach him to bite? And this is, you, you didn't force him to bite, did you? You've been training this dog all along, you know, forcing him down, you've been forcing him to sit. And now, all of a sudden, you're forcing him to quit biting. 
Okay. Now, if you were the dog, what would be your general attitude about biting after that? You'd be really concerned about biting with this human stand behind here with a pinch collar on or whatever. Conflict. Yeah. They're creating a great deal of conflict that way. So that leads us into one of our things that we're going to begin getting into this week is how can we teach a dog to release without ever having to give him a correction on the protection field? Because we realize what a conflict we're creating there. Because we have to make the correction because we want him to stop biting. But do we have to make a correction? Is there another way to do it? I said before, we can teach the dog and we can learn to communicate. So what happens if we learn to communicate first? We teach him what out is in some other way altogether. So the first time he hears it on the correction, on the protection field, it's not going to be such a traumatic experience. Okay, so we're utilizing our communication now. Okay, let's try another example. Let's say your dog's out running around in, in your backyard field or whatever, and you call him, he doesn't come to you. And you call him again, and he doesn't come to you. So you got to get to work or whatever. Okay, I'm going to have to go out. You chase the dog around, yelling at him and doing everything you can. He still can't get him. You finally get him cornered in one little corner of the yard. And you get about as far as me from you, and his name's Duke. You get him, come on, Duke, get over here. He comes walking over here. Now you got him, okay. What, what are you going to do? Are you going to give him a negative motivation, a positive motivation, or not? So again, we start going through this one. Um, I would give him positive. 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 Everybody. Everybody understand. Yeah. All right. You know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Again, you're identifying what the dog was doing at the instant that you have the opportunity to decide what you're going to do, that you're going to give the motivation. That's that's one of the biggest problems we went into in training. And you know, everybody wants the dog to come, and you know half these owners they'll go out and they finally get the dog to come, and they'll you know kill them when they come, and then they wonder how come my dog doesn't come. Yeah, exactly. Let's take another uh, problem that for most of you is simple thing. We're, we're teaching our dog to sit stay. And in our, our particular being in school, the way we're going to do it is we tell the person how to do a sit. And we say, now as soon as you can, drop your leash or take the leash off and get away from him where you're not pressuring him. And he's over here doing a sit stay. Now, if he moves, run back and correct him. Right away, just go back and interpret him and make the correction. Okay. So the dog moves, you race back, you grab him, sit, 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 and you jerk him back into a correction. Okay. So I care to guess what you're really teaching the dog. You're afraid you run it. Mm -hmm. Aren't you? Yeah. Did you get him in time to teach him he was wrong for getting up? No. Then it's too late. Exactly. I just made a mistake with my, I don't know where I made the bad thing. I just made a mistake with a dog that I've got. I got a dog. It's a possibility of a, a strongly competitive dog. Okay? She has ability to do all three phases. She's not strong. She's not a tough dog. But she's a dog that's going to be adequate. In fact, the first time I showed her a chisel one, she got 100 points of protection. Okay, what would happen if I put her on a down stay? Because she knows down real good. Okay? And she's 50 not yards from me. Yeah. We should have gone. Okay, but because the way we've been doing the agitation, we carry a little whip with us, we go crack, and it goes bang, crack, and it goes bang. And so she's learned that when she hears that bang, protection works, she's going to get the bite. Okay? So, I'm a smart guy, at least I think I am. I put her out there on a down state, and I shoot a gun. Sounds just like the whip did when it was cracking. The dog gets up. What should I do? I mean, so what should you have yeah. done? <laughs> Just ignore her and put her back. That's exactly right. It, and but not yet. Yeah. yeah, what did I do? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> do, do, do. Like, <laughs> we got it. What do you think she learned from that? So the gun goes up. Yeah. 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 You return to her on a long man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, no, it got worse than that. Well, now when you. He didn't just make one mistake. Yeah. Here you go. I did it. It was at a dog. I mean, it was when I showed her for a shift. She's 
the 10 points on her long down because she got up and walked over to me and looking all around, you know, where's the agitator? We took her out since then. We've taken her out and shot the gun a couple times and made her stay. And what she does, she gets at the end and goes, <laughs> <laughs> she's looking for something to happen with agitation. But I made a mistake here doing things that I'm telling you not to do because I didn't, I reacted. I didn't think about it, okay? You can't train a dog emotionally. You've got to train a dog. It's That's everybody's be, biggest mistake. It really yeah, is. It's got to be very platonic. It, I tell people. Did you quit using the whip any stage? No, we're still using it. But I, not that it's hurting anything. We just got to recognize what what kind of problem we've got. And I've, I've still got a bitch that's got a problem with the long down. I go out and shoot over her now. I, I did yesterday. And I had her on a long line. What did she do? She started sitting up and barking at me. <laughs> and now when I, when I put her on a down, she's really nervous because she knows I'm going to come over and make corrections. We're getting it, it solved now. But I got a dog that's terribly afraid of the down and actually appears to be afraid of the gunfire. But yet, when she was a younger dog, I, I did all kinds of shooting around. I'd take her a lot of times when I went out yeah. and she, she's not at all gun shy. But I've trained this into her without realizing, without thinking. All I'm doing is, is saying that we can't, you've got to think about a problem. A lot of times, if, if you see a problem developing with your dog, I think you're better off to say, okay, I'm not, gonna, I'm not sure what's going on here. I'm going to go home and think about it. And one friend I worked with over in Germany, he says, yeah, they said, let me think about a couple weeks. Not, not over now, I'm going to think about a couple weeks. <laughs> then I come back and I tell you what, our, what I'm going to do now to solve this problem. You can be 100% sure if a dog makes a mistake once, he's going to make it again. Yeah. And so you don't have to make your correction or decide what to do about any particular problem that instant. You've got time, you can always set up the situation again and make the mistake, make him make the mistake when you're ready to do the right thing with it. And I think what everybody does is they get emotional and say, oh, damn it, why is this dog doing, you know, and you just rush into it. And then you always end up with another problem. <laughs> Now, another thing that we're going to teach in the form of communication is we're going to teach a sit and a down stay. And we're going to do it from a sit. And if the dog moves on his sit from the very beginning, when he wants to sit, if he moves, we're going to go, no, sit. Sure. Put him in. So it's three things. No, sit, and the correction. In some cases, I have other people that believe we'd be better off just to go no and jerk without saying sit. They say that if you say no, sit, and crack, you're going to make the dog afraid of the word sit. I don't know. Yeah. We're we thinking always, about this. We always train it that way where we say, where we say no and the, and the command. Yeah. So, we say no, sit. so when you do the, when you go to off leash, you can go no, sit, and, and verbally correct the dog instead of having to use the leash. Okay. But there's something to be said for both oh, ways, right. but I do the same way you do. That's, that's you, know, we, you know, how training changes and so forth. But it's something to think about. But what we do then is we then begin using the word no more to our advantage. Not meaning no, you're a terrible dog, we're going to hurt you, but no meaning stop. In fact, for a long time, I, in fact, our training book that we use says stop instead of no. Only thing is, I've been saying no for so many years, I can't break my habit. People say, well, why do you say that you should say stop and then you do no? Uh, so I gave up and I can't change me, so I'll use no for all people. Put the dog on a sit. The lady want to sit, I don't say stay, I say sit again because we can't say stay. It's just, I walk out in front of the dog, say the dog moves, and I go, no, 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 sit. Okay, and go back and make the correction. I go back out again. So I'm teaching him no means stop and don't go anywhere. Now the reason I brought this up now is to show you with the training. I'm now beginning to bridge this timing gap. I'm going outside of this one second thing. I'm teaching him that as long as I'm running at you saying no, you're going to get a correction, right? Everybody understands that. What would happen now if I walked up to the dog and didn't say anything? If you were the dog, what would you expect? Would you have a favorable impression or unfavorable with me walking towards you? Favorable. Yeah, because you, you know nothing's going to happen because I'm not threatening you. If I walk up saying no, you're worried. 
Okay, if you're on a sit stay and you're the dog and I'm running at you saying no, what's your first instinct going to be? Right. Get out of there. Okay, that's exactly what I want you to do. Because if you do, I'm in position to stop it. I still got the lead in my hand. So from the very beginning, I'm trying to break this flight instinct that all animals have. So I'm intentionally You're intentionally creating a problem in order to solve, to solve the problem. problem. Okay. Now I get further and further and further away from the dog, and eventually remove the leash of any kind, long line of whatever. And now when the dog makes a mistake, and I go, no, down, the dog will do exactly that. Now I'm communicating with it. We have a, English. Yeah, we have a rule that says we will not correct the dog if they're off leash. Because we don't really want to take a chance, okay? With some exceptions. But basically, you know, rules all got exceptions. But basically, that, that's the rule we like to go by. But if the dog is on lead, he always, you know, under, underline always, always gets a correction. Every time. Always. If we don't, we become nags and we're threatening all the time. We're not backing up. The dog's bought and paid for a correction. So when he hears the word no and he's on leave, what's going to happen? The freeze. And he's going to get a correction. Okay? Now, just to show where we can go with this, you got your Schutzen 3 dog, you've been trained for four years, he's competitive, he knows the out, the teaching has been done, now we're in a training phase, and the dog's out there biting the agitator. You call out, and he doesn't let out. What are you going to do? He's off lead. He can't do anything, can you? But you can't let it go. And if you go back on lead, he's going to out because he's so used to that routine. So what we do here is no, 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 all the way to the dog, out, 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 like this, and go back again. So when, when you go all the way up to the dog, you said he's off lead there. Yeah. You go all the way up to the dog, you, you, all the way up, you're saying no, no, no. Uh -huh. Then when you get up to him, you hook the leash in? It, well, in most cases, we have a little pad on them. Okay, point, but we have the leash in. Okay. But, That's a real advanced dog. Yeah, I'm, I'm going from the very beginning, right. Right now, all the way to the end. This is show you how it fits in. Now, why do we go to all that trouble? Now, how many people, how many times I've seen it, I can tell you, supposedly good trainers. I can show you one at the Meister Chef, where the dog is running, I mean, at the Bundesliga, the guy's dog is running off with the dumbbell, you know, a well-known trainer. Why? Because he scared the dog so bad and he never stopped that flight instinct. And he goes running up on his dog. He may not be saying no. He's just running up and the dog oh my God, here he comes. He's gone. <laughs> and then pretty soon you've got a dog that he doesn't know what's going on when he's out on that field. He doesn't know when you're going to come up and kick him, what you're going to do. And instead of watching the agitator, he's going bark, bark, and looking, bark. Bark, bark, and he's looking back and forth. He's so worried about what you're going to do that he really can't perform well. That, that thing is really why I have the thing. Oh, that was Blanca. Somebody mentioned her looking back. That's why I, I will probably never get rid of it at her age, but that's what it stemmed from, was not using the verbal. I was right. quiet with it and would run up and make the correction. Now, she'll stop. If she sees me running up, she stops and waits for a correction. But because I didn't use no, 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 when I'm quiet, she doesn't know what's going on back there either, and she has to give us one of these. Now, when I first learned of this technique, I was in Germany, and the trainer that told me about it, in fact, we were over there for uh, the SV trial in Salzburg that I was competing in. WSB. WSB. When the, when the trainer first told me about this, I said, oh, man, you know, that's going to make the dog worse. It's going to make him look behind it even worse. And a lot of the people then, especially in Florida, picked up on this and started going home and doing it to their dogs. And boy, they run off the field, they're looking terrible, just running dogs. And what had happened is they had missed this very beginning phase. You go out and do that to a dog for the first time, you get in your car and chase him, as I know one person did. So you, you've got to keep everything in perspective, you've got to keep everything in steps, and you've got to think about this timing thing. You've got to figure always, what is the dog really learning from this? What is he likely to do? And again, take that space example if you want to call it that or whatever. Think back, think, what if it was me? And I had some 
playing uh, this little space alien making all kinds of funny noises and coming up behind me. Am I going to be able to run away from him? You know, what have I learned? You got to call, you know, go back to where I learned. Okay, let's take some questions now from you guys and even think up things if you want to. And let's go through and let's, let's try to put it into the little structure that we set up. Let's, let's start talking about these problems and how we would solve them. Any, any kind of problem you can think of that's not a complex problem. But go ahead and bring up something let's talk about and see how we can work it out. Anything? <laughs> you might have problem. Anything. Beating is protected. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, sit down. I was going to say, when, if you commit, you stop, go off, take the bikes. Okay, this is, I, I think one of the times I got into it, the hard yeah. thing to, to answer about that is the fact that a dog never learns that it's all right to bite from one by correcting you before he ever does it, and never allowing him to do it. He's not going to have much intensity when he goes into the blind bar. Okay. So, I think I really got myself into a damn thing. I think you're doing it. Okay, you're, you're I, I think we're way too complicated for, this is something for Thursday, probably. But let me, since I got here, let's go ahead and talk. <laughs> yeah, I got to I thought I was going to Okay. The, and, and you've already touched on it. The, we always did it on the basis that when the dog ran into the blind, when he's thinking about it, because that makes sense with my little situation, my little structure that I set up. You should make the correction while it's on the dog's mind, I'm going in to bite, and then he should go in and not try to bite and come off. Okay. Now, Gary brought up the real problem here. That's why I say it's, much, it's far too complex to even fit into this little thing that we're talking about. What we found out is by doing that, the result was we had a dog that would sit, number one, too far out of the blind, and he'd go walking into the blind and whoop, 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 you know, like it's just kind of something he's doing. You know, no, no drive, you know, no real reason to go racing. Just think down about what is hard. the dog learning? When you make, you know, at what instant he's getting the correction? What is he doing in that instant? Okay. I thought it was a dog though that was already very good in the blind, and now he's cheating. He's coming in, and he is so intense, and now you're trying to slow him down to because he's causing the point. Yeah, that, uh, but it, it holds true for either one. Yeah. I, said this, I really got. Well, I would have said I, I agree with you. I mean, I would have said that too until. We saw this start well, working a little bit. The way it was proven to us is when we were in Germany this last time when Holly competed, we were with six different people. Half were going to the Bundesliga and half were going to the Meisterschaft. <coughs> and we were dealing with one guy that had this particular problem. And it was interesting because we could go to their clubs, we could see, because most of these people were trained directors of their clubs, and we could see all the clubs and how their dogs were doing, what problems they had based on his way of training. The thing that they brought, brought out to us, it was better to let the dog go in and make the bite and then make the correction. The reason was, and Gary hit it on the head, is you want the dog to go into the blind with a lot of drive, let him make the mistake, and then correct him while he's making the mistake, which timing-wise is still at the appropriate time. But we found that by doing that, the dog went in and sat closer and had a much better cadence of barking. So for that reason, it worked better to jerk him after he'd actually bit. But again, as I said, this is not fitting in well to the discussion at all to talk about something that complex. I can. Well, I was going to sort of on the same thing. Uh, I've gotten some conflicting advice, and I, I don't think that a problem has developed yet. But the conflicting advice was in the very beginning of one that's not real strong like mine is it good to teach the app? Let me tell you what I did. I, my dog has a real strong prey drive. And I long ago decided that, you know, when we're playing tug of war with the bunny back, I'm, if I say out, I, I just stop playing with her until she drops it. And now I've noticed that on the field, uh, we do the same thing. I, uh, if I say out, she's, she won't let me take the flea boy from her. So I say out, and we don't do anything, she drops it. And then I, I'm able to kick it out, you know, to the agitator again. She's learning it. When I say out now, she drops it. And I was given the advice that that was a mistake. I should never teach her out. But what my idea was that she likes to play. You know, she wants to chase and she wants to get that thing and fight for it. And she's not going to get to do that again unless she out. Because that is that a good uh, is my uh, is my idea. Yeah. Okay? Again, it's it's a little outside of what we're talking about. But uh, 
what you're doing is you're, remember we said you can teach with positive reinforcement yeah. or negative reinforcement. What you want to watch is the use of negative reinforcement during bike work. Well, we it's would, not negative. Right. Just, right. So if you do something positively, I never worry about it. If you teach something positive, you, you don't have to worry about it. You don't, you don't get problems when you teach things in a structured manner using positive reinforcement. You just don't get problems. But when you use negative reinforcement, that's when you get problems. So what the person was telling you was probably they were feeding back something they had heard that until she's ready for it and got a, the right kind of binder, then we don't want to teach her a compulsive valve, which would be exactly correct. But to teach her a positive, or what we call an inducing valve like that, that would be perfectly okay. Well, uh, 9% of the time, yeah. Yeah, no, so that, that's why I said you can't get into trouble when you're using positive. Anything, Does everybody understand that? Maybe, maybe that. You know, need some discussion. Okay, let me just try, since we're getting, I think, a little too confusing with some of these examples. To, uh, what I want to, I really want to do is to get to think We're not, let right. me say this, we're not talking about obedience. What we're trying to talk about is how the dog learns, okay? And uh, that would be either in tracking obedience or protection. So what you're talking about now and using is no method. Mm -hmm. Say with a dog like one Bouvier, and he starts his track, this is nose, no correction. And get back on track again. That would be the same principle you're talking about. That's exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. No stop that behavior. And then showing the right and then the right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Just to, I, maybe this is not a, a, a good, stop me if this is the wrong thing to talk about, but it seems to me I've thought of it several times when you've been talking. Uh, Blanca, okay, she ships in three, she's training for UD. I have a lot of. Uh, vocabulary that she knows and she's easy to teach things to she catches on fast we're working on the um, sense discrimination okay and I had the articles tied down to a little board and as long as I only had uh, one or two articles out there we were doing all right I'd send her out for that okay and she usually pick up the right one and come back uh, then I started putting a few more articles out there, and she made a mistake. I forget what it was. Anyway, I had to make a, a oh, she went out and decided she wasn't going to pick up anything. She was just going to go out there and, you know, sniff and then look up at the ceiling. The time said, correct her. So I went out and I made my, my correction that I would correct her for not picking up, you know, for not doing the retrieve. So the next time I sent her out, she ran out, grabbed anything, which was tied down, and dropped the whole board back to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm standing there thinking, now what do I do? Time to put the board back out there and correct her again. Correct, you know, send her out, make her pick up the right article. Run out and bring her up and make her pick up the right article. Then she refused to go out. And I'm just thinking into the floor. I hear the whole thing is going down the drain. And you can see it makes sense to think about what the dog is trying. She's trying to learn, but she's picking up the wrong things each time. And it took us maybe 15 minutes to work through that. She was highly indignant about the whole thing. She just thought it was totally ridiculous. But at the end of the 15 minutes, she understood what it was I wanted her to do. It wasn't reliable, but she understood what I wanted her Shouldn't to do. Shouldn't you just back up, do more fundamentals, and take her back out? That's what, I've done in the, than that's what I've done in the past. She's had quite a bit of that. Uh, what, what we would want to do is, first of all, begin limiting these variables, like tie the whole board down. So yeah. yeah, oh, I forgot that. Yeah. I did do that. Yeah. We tied the whole board down so she couldn't pick it and up and all back. In fact, the whole discussion this afternoon about the steps of protection, you're going to see our method is completely designed around eliminate the possible possibility of things going wrong. Trying to make, you know, try to focus everything to where the dog is forced to do it right. Try to, try to avoid corrections at all costs and just just make your situation the structure to where you're forcing him to do it right. He has no other possibility. He has to go out and do it correctly. Let me give you another little example that might make sense. Let's say that you've got a dog that is very aggressive in the home. When people come over, he's at the door and is trying to eat him up. Very, very aggressive dog. So the owner of the dog, you see that somebody you're training or whatever, and you go to watch them, and you see that the owner of the dog, when you walk in, grabs the dog by the collar and pulls him back and says, he's okay, he's a nice guy, you don't have to act aggressive, you know, it's okay, calm down. Okay, is that a, uh, are they, what are they teaching the dog by doing that? Teaching that everybody comes up to the door, it's going to be all right. They teach him, when he comes up to the door, it's all right. 
No, he's praying. No, he's praying in a room. That's what most people do. They'll, right. they'll either praise for the aggression or they'll all of it, or they'll avoid it completely by putting the dog out in the backyard or putting the dog in the bathroom. Right. But still, they're not correcting for dealing with that situation. Right. So, so you're actually supporting the problem. Okay. Now, what you'll find, now all of this, what, what he's saying and what you guys have said is all true, and it's, a very, it's an example that's very easy to understand, and it's what you see all pet people do. But we all do the same thing in much smaller degrees in our training without realizing and I think that yeah we're trying right. to teach us to keep these small ideas in perspective when we get out there exactly yeah, the yeah. Like, yeah. Think, right. think, in, in the, think about the little right. thing you got to try and learn to think the way the dog's thinking just take the converse of that same thing let's say that the dog's scared to death Backing it up to scared to death or somebody like show dogs that we train for like that once you tell them we had teachers to stand for the judge this was our first thousand dollar dog in the corner. It's a lot of money, you know, I just got out of college, I spent a thousand dollars, oh Jesus, you know, this dog. I can't get it, I can't, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been part of spend that much money for a dog. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, here's this dog, and we give him a professional handler, because we couldn't show her. Why couldn't we show her? She was so damn afraid of the judge. The judge would walk out, oh, she's going backwards. Okay, we're, we're telling her, don't be afraid of the judge. It's okay, it's okay. What are we doing? We're praising the dog again, aren't we? We're supporting the behavior. The more she backs up, the more we're saying, hey, good dog, keep backing up, right? That's what we're doing. To her, that's what she's What does this professional handler do? I mean, this guy, we're paying, what, $40 to show this damn dog for <laughs> let me take her. Oh, we want to watch. We want to see what you're going to do. Now you don't need to watch. Yeah, we want to watch. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep our mouth shut. You don't want to watch. So we went through that, but we got to watch. Okay. He takes, puts the pinch collar on, takes off his hand, and says, you, 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 I want you to go over this dog. As, as they walk up, man, he's jerking and picking her up and shaking her and throwing her around and just kicking her and beating her. Not that bad. With her, she, she won. Got her, still got the trophy. Basically, he made, that, he made that behavior not in her best interest. Yeah. She was more concerned about what he was going to do to her than what, what that, that person was going to do to this walk. But doesn't there come a point also where you, where you can go overboard with the negative? And, and once the dog starts to do some of that behavior, okay. you've got to show some positive. Boy, that's a real appropriate comment yeah. right now. Very appropriate. Because what happens if you over-motivate with a negative correction? Okay, let's go back to our little example again. I said timing within a second, <laughs> motivation, or the psychologists call it reinforcement, either positive or negative. And the last thing is consistency, which we haven't talked about. That is, that's obvious. If, if you're 100% consistent and you do everything right all the time, the dog's going quicker. Now, what happens when you get a dog that's got a terrible attitude? Okay, he's been trained in obedience, he's just got a terrible attitude, his hands hanging out, his hate to do it. Is it because the person was too hard on him, and correctly and too hard, or because he didn't have the right consistency? Believe it or not, the answer in most cases, not every time, but it's because the person didn't have the consistency he showed up, not because of the strength of the correction. What happens then if you overcorrect a dog, if you make the correction too hard, too motivational, more than you need it? All it does is create anxiety, okay? That makes the dog very nervous, okay? What happens let's, when the dog gets very nervous? He can't learn. What happens when he can't learn? He makes more mistakes. What happens when he makes more mistakes? You get mad. And then you become inconsistent with what you're doing. And pretty soon... You, you get emotional, you get inconsistent, you get too hard, and pretty soon the whole training thing has just gone down the drain. Yeah. I think I have a good example, maybe a good advice, where I made a bad mistake with my dog. She used to be a tremendous, uh, you know, uh, attitude on the, re um, on the recall. But I kept getting all these half points off for the slight, very slightly crooked front. So I started working like mad, and every time the dog came in and slightly put its head up front, I'd correct her. Okay? You can guess what happened. Now I've got a slow recall because she's worried about it the whole time that she's coming in. Oh, God, i got to think about this. i got to get sure. She'll actually scoot over after she's back to it, but she's slow now. And I don't know what to do to overcome it. I was too hard on her. I worked front just continually. I don't know. I don't know. But again, I don't. I don't, you see her do it. Yeah, I don't like to say somebody's too hard on a dog 
Being hard on them produces a different bag of problems that, that, that had their own characteristics. I think what was wrong was the training method itself was wrong. But let me go back and, and explain why. We've got a rule that says we never correct a dog that's coming to you. Well, that's good. Then you come back and say, okay, Tom, you know, I, I, I buy what you say. Now, what do I do when he comes in and says crooked? I say, okay, you know, no problem. Let's sit crooked. If you're doing that, then you teach him to sit crooked, aren't you? So what are you going to do when he comes in and sits crooked? You're going to have to make a correction, right? Well, what happens if you make a correction? And the dog says, well, I'm not going to them. They're going to correct me every time, you know. And that's, that's a difficult problem to solve. That's exactly the one that you had. What we do in a case like that is we go and we say, you can correct the dog that's coming to you if you made him come to you. In other words, if he's on a leash and you jerk him to get him to come, and as he comes in, you jerk up and make him sit the way you want it. Then you can do it. But our feeling is when you take them off lead, let's not correct them when they come to us. Okay. Now, that's playing with fire, isn't it? Because you don't know if he's going to come in and sit straight. You don't know. Of course, if you get ready to go show the dog, you think, well, I'm not going to take him into the show ring the first time and find out how straight my sit is going to be. But it's almost what you got to do in some cases. And as soon as you see the dog start backing off from the speed of the recall, you got to think, i got to start dividing these exercises up. And that's what we write about in our book. We've tried to teach too many things at once. Like we said, we've got to synthesize, which we've got to divide this up in proportions. What's wrong? Well, she just told me her step front is wrong, and now the speed of the recall is wrong. Two entirely different things, right? They're not even related. Except we put them together to make one exercise. But as far as the way the dog runs, they're not related. What do we need to do? Well, we've got to speed up the recall first. Well, let's eliminate the set front. As soon as the dog is six feet away, let's say free, have a sleeve behind him, give him a bite on the sleeve, or throw a ball, or uh, give him a piece of food, or do something real positive so the dog loves to come to you. But let's skip the set front. And, but let's always skip it. Will it for man, free or okay or whatever as the dog comes in? Okay, now what about the set front? Well, let's go, we'll show you a bunch of exercises like next week we call doodling. Let's go to stuff where we have the dog sit here. I'm standing with these footsteps, the dog facing me. I turn and I go here, and the dog has to turn around and sit front. I turn and here, and he has to go around and sit front. Oh, that's not late. Maybe, yeah, maybe put him over here, here, and he has to come over here and sit. So now I'm working on the sit front. Once the dog has passed this test, and now I can sit here and do like this, and he just keeps adjusting, always sitting in front. What are the chances then, with my good recall now, that dog's racing in, what are the chances he's going to sit front? Well, I, I said another key word to a little bit ago. I said if you do things positively, you can't get much trouble, right? Well, if we taught him what a sit front is, maybe we even taught him the word sit front, I don't know, but if we taught him what a word means, and he does something, and we don't want to make a correction then, what's wrong with maybe talking him into where he's supposed to be? People don't think of that. So you call your dog, and as he comes, I use the word here to sit front. And as he's running to me, I go here, here, and I kind of move my position back here, here, and the dog comes, ah, that's good, and I give him a piece of food. So I've really talked, talking up into me, using communication that I've taught him, rather than making a last minute correction. Okay, so we've divided it up, we've made the positive and negative where we where we needed it, and we should end up with a pretty good exercise. But all this, it maybe sounds theoretical, but it's all real important. And if you do that, you're going to have a good exercise. If we teach an out without making hard corrections, or without making any kind of correction, if we get the dog to just release because of things that we've taught him elsewhere, we're going to have a dog that doesn't have any hang-ups about biting or you walking up on it. As an example, and my bitch Queenie, when I said I got 100 points of protection, I just simply taught her that out, plops, and down is all different words for the same thing. That means lay down. So if we're playing with her on a sack or whatever, I'm just doing something with her, and I say out, she'll lay down. So by the time I went to the agitator and I said out, what she did? She did what she's been taught to do. I didn't have to make a correction. Had I made a correction, she was a very weak bitch. Had I made a correction, what would have happened? I would have lost my bike. I didn't have much bike to lose. <laughs>
So I'd have to really watch that. So this, these are ideas and, and theories that we're going to be dealing with this constantly over the next few days, trying to make people I'm going to say, what is a dog learning? Every training session that we do, we're going to go out and we're going to video that training session. We're going to come back in and we're going to say, okay, Ruby's doing this, this, and this. What do we need to do now to train this? I'm going to even go so far as making you guys take this paper that we passed out there. You're going to write down what your problems are. We're going to work out a plan on each dog as to what we're going to do, both for tracking, obedience, and protection. Try to give you a whole roadmap of what you need to do. Yeah. Excuse me. Going back to her uh, thing with the dog. Uh, with the recall, what would happen if you had a dog that you were not going to be able to motivate to come in faster to you with the sleep or food or happy times or whatever? No inducive motivation was bringing that dog in faster because, like she was saying, possibly she overcorrected to sit front. Mm -hmm. Where would you go from there? I'm assuming she would be afraid to make any corrections on the recall because she's made too many corrections already. Yeah. I'm using food. Okay, yeah. but I'm saying what would happen? What would happen if you had a dog that did not respond to the food? Use another trainer. Dog has a Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I use negative motivation and still come up with the with what I want? I think you're going to lose a little bit when you use negative motivation. Okay. Yeah. You, I act like I'm scared to death of negative motivation. I'm not. But there's a time and a place for it. Yeah. I think that was tough because you know how she was with her recall and uh, and two nights before that match. Mm -hmm. And it was just jerking her head halfway down the thing. And she better get that quick. And she yeah. does. And see, I don't yeah. think I lose a whole lot on the negative motivation. I mean, when you're exasperated and you're well, she's up, you know, this dog has been over the hill, uh, over the threshold, not negative. Yeah. Negative, yeah. Right? yeah. So you have to reverse that. I, yeah. think, I think also it depends a lot on the dog. Yeah. 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 Well, well, man, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, we, we've even uh, had dogs that were real slow on their retreat, hide somebody in the bushes as they started back. It popped them with a BB gun in the butt. And it yeah. Was bad. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that with a guy. I've seen that with a slingshot for hunting dogs. Yeah. 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 I was going to say, I can't see how it won't reverse itself. Uh, just laying off of it would help. You know, maybe right. you're taking a break from the cum. And if you don't feed the dog for a day or two, it will become food motivated. Make it more yeah. motivated. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Okay. okay. I just. I just brought that up from the standpoint yeah. you were saying so much against the negative motivation. I was wondering what the what the deal was. I, there, as we talked about <coughs> in the very beginning, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat, but really that's what we want to do with the seminar. We want to everybody contributing. That's what we're talking about, getting everybody feeling like you're not afraid to say something. If you're out there, actually, we're going to be carrying you down. You know, but we're going to be building you up at the same time. And we're going to do that with your dog. I want everybody to be honest about the dog. I don't know if the, uh, you're still here. Uh, the, I think she gets a little defensive every now and then. Because the things I say that I see in her dog, I tell her. I don't say, you know, she's a little bit this, but this. I say, this is, you know, a big deal, and, and this is wrong, and you're doing this bad, and so forth. And sometimes people have a little trouble handling it. But unless you can admit and recognize your problems, you're never going to be able to train that dog. If you don't, like that dog, that disabled dog I had, at that stage in training, had I gone to a, a trainer that knew Schutz and then he told me about this dog, I probably knew would, it. Yeah. Knew the dog was but I would have probably really reacted to it at the time. It's taken some maturity for me in growing with the sport to realize that when somebody tells me about the temperament of the dog, I got to accept it as that. Because until I do, how can I possibly devise training them? So you're going to. That's another thing. It, it hurts us as far as salespeople are concerned because I'm going to tell you every problem my dog has. And somebody else is going to say, well, I got a stud dog who doesn't have any problems. So you're going to agree to his stud dog because he's such a good <laughs> There is no such animal. <laughs> <laughs> but we really, we really want to analyze what we're doing. We really want, that's, the, that's our goal for you folks to be able to send you home really thinking about this and really understanding what you're doing is correct, what you're doing is wrong, what your dog's like. And your next dog, what you're going to do different. You know, I don't care if you want to admit to me what problems your dog has, but you got to admit them to yourself. No, I think, I think you got to admit it to somebody else. Oh, I maybe. think you've got to do it. I'm glad my wife's not here. He's going to stick the knife in the I'm going to stick the knife in the Do we have pretty much a game plan um, on what we're going to do each day as far as what the book is lined up also, so you can tell us this is what we're
covering in the book, so maybe that night we can read and be ready for it the next day or whatever. Yeah, that, that brings up a lot of the book. one kind of difficult uh, area to cover. Uh, a book is kind of like a dictionary. You know, I, I was Bobby, I said as soon as it came off the presses, it was uh, no longer accurate. Well, that is true in one respect to some extent with the book. Everything that you read about the imprinting is exactly the same with a few new things that we can add in, a few things that we didn't write about that we can show you. Same with the beans, same with the tracking. But where, where we have really, I think, come away since writing the book has been with protection. So we're, I'm not going to tell you something that's wrong that's in the book, but I'm, I think I mentioned that to somebody this morning. We're into a lot of things that we're into a second generation. And that was some of the, the thought behind it behind having the seminar was to show people that have that basis, that know what we were doing at the time that we wrote the book, how we have really improved on some of those things. So the, the ideas are, are pretty much the same. As far as the game plan is concerned, what we are, are, are going to be doing, and this is something we've gone back and forth trying to figure out what's going to make it both interesting to people, keep it moving along so you don't get bored listening to too much lecture, and, and get everybody also working with their own dog. And what we've decided to do, as I said today, we're going to talk about this afternoon about the steps in protection. We're going to use demonstration dogs to show these dogs being worked and possibly talk and work a little bit with some agitation. We'll come back in and we won't possibly get to everybody, but come back in and talk about with the video. Then in the morning, we're going to get started with track lane, which would be something that would be well worth reading that section of the book about track lane. What we've done is I've gone out and purchased $50 worth of silver dollars. We've drawn a little track, a little shits and free track. We're going to go out to the field. Everybody's going to buy some silver dollars from it, take three per track. And you're going to go out and lay a track and you're going to run it yourself. 30 minutes later, after yeah. you walk around and talk to everybody. I'll spin you around, put a blindfold on it. Yeah, you know, no. But we, one of the most important things of tracking is to know where the track is. So we want to, that's where we'll start with that. Then tomorrow afternoon, we're going to try to get your dogs lined up and where, where they belong as far as protection training is concerned. We're going to video that and we're going to talk about that. intentionally back them up. The dogs don't show any defense at all. And this fear, we may have to back them up to get them to show defense, okay? But in this dog's case, you can walk all the way up on him, okay? And to stand there, and you're actually uh, moving towards being motionless. You're, you're actually come up until you're just standing there, challenge him, he's going crazy, barking, all of a sudden it's like you get scared and you run away again. Can we have Bruce try that with him? Okay, you want to do that? Uh, I'll do it too. Then. You want to do it either way? Yeah, I didn't. A lot of times it depends on the animal. He, uh, he's actually doing pretty well. Yeah, he's doing real well. Yeah. 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 Oh. 
got real good attention. He just doesn't. He's not a barker. He's not thinking what to do oh, yet. Yeah. Two and a half. This dog will not bark. Very well barked. We'll, we'll have to teach him to bark eventually. But it is, yeah, his attention is. Oh, yeah. Is yeah. yeah. He does. He likes to get you in close. Yeah. But even, you know, when you're fairly close, you don't hate Bill, you're very close. Yeah. And the dog's not going to like that. How far are Keep on going in, and then you get Trying any get kind of a noise, he's going to turn around. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Even that yeah. little bit. Yeah. Pretty soon, what we want the dog to learn is that he's in control with both his stare and his bark to, to chase you away. But see how at this point we're getting a, a good stare off between the two. They're, they're challenging one another. Do you want to try and lock eyes with the dog? Yeah. It's, it's just, if he's strong enough to do it. Right. It's, it's, there's a lot of talent in the window going up and window going down and there's no set rule. See, as soon as that dog would start to back up, he's got a hard decision to make. Do you run away when the dog backs up? No, you can't do that. Do you keep staring at the dog? And, you know, what do you do with it? I think they all get it right back in the distance. I'm not used to popping a whip that has that long a piece of leather on it. Mine has a... We're better off with a shorter one. Leather about this long. If you got with you, you No, I didn't bring it because okay. the club needed it. So long ago. Are you selling those yet? Yeah, I, I just sold them out on the damn thing. I got a whole bunch of them more. I got about 150 of them more. I got to where Mike McCall and a bunch of these guys are buying them from me. I'm going to try, no try that rot water one because we've had a lot of them in our yep. club. Okay. I think over and over again like that, he's going to get him out. Yeah. Okay. You, you got to press him, I think, more. What? Yeah. What? Uh, here, before you do it, let me check. What, what I would recommend here, and we'll do it without your approval on that, but what I would say, and if it were my dog, I would have the person walk up to the dog, not in a threatening way, but hi, good buddy. Good boy. Right, and then flank him and run off. 
You want to try that? Yeah, and that's, here. And that should here. creates a Who's fear that causes the defense you know, reaction. Is he bitten anybody? <laughs> yeah. Oh, be careful. Oh. What's his name? Baron. Yeah, there he oh. is. Yeah, that's the problem. Is yeah. He's all, he's all, all like I noticed with other though. people a lot of times. He, uh, now do the same thing, only come up, yeah, if you put the luck away. He can pull out. Now you know he's <laughs> I thought that would probably go to skiing across the ground. Like <laughs> <laughs> Keep going, Gary. Got the line good, Holly? <laughs> Got a big knot in it. Oh. We'll get some good sooner later. Yeah. Good, puppy. Good, puppy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there he goes. Okay. That's what we want good. to get. Oh, like you said, the air's coming up, yeah. showing a little bit here, and it's going to then... Hey, yeah. Okay. yeah. On one of my dashes away, when he really lunges, would it be good to give him a lot of line yeah, to let him chase a little ways? Gary, I'm huh? trying, but he's only going so far oh, and he's he? not pulling the rest out. Oh, okay. He's, checking, he's you starting had, to learn it. Did you get any dogs pull that line out about 15, 20 feet on one chase? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, standing that's on that's it, we it's not tight, so be careful. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we want the dogs. Oh. Yeah. It looked like Rudy was pulling a lot hard, maybe. Well, he takes a lot of crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you'll see that our club dogs from that can actually work. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they're just out there pulling for all their work. I mean, on 30 Constant. foot of line. Yeah. In fact, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. That's what you see there. A little bark. Okay. I think that's enough for him. For, what we're looking for now is some food for discussion. Right? And then we'll work. Uh, uh, we've got another method, too, that we've used on this. The reverend. Not in front of you, right? Okay, what he's doing when she lost the way. Thank you. We have a like that. Yeah. You been tied up before, sir? Yeah.
I can just feel hate and rage inside of me when I'm approaching them. And man, they just the turn on like Most crazy. Most people get dog bit because when they get up, the dog is scared of them, they start camping up. And I've seen the dog bit them. Really? The reaction when they walk up on the dog is different from the dog. Oh, man! Oh, man! Is this a different variety? Yeah. Um, what has told you to get up the line? This one? Maybe, uh... Something they need to stay away from the dog. You want me to untangle that? No, I don't think so. I think he needs to run. Really, he's not going to stay with the dog. No, he's never been out on a line. I know, but he needs to cut this good for him right here. He learned to get untangled. What I mean, like, he's a dog. He's not dumb. He's been along. They come dog. Y'all tie out? Yeah. Yeah. And once they start showing in, then you go to work. Yeah. And we start out like they do with the spark, which is what we do. I made up. You asked about untiming. Normally we don't. Yeah, I'm just let them worry. Because otherwise it feels like you spend all your time I'm untiming. You need to call for it's an interesting body type. Look at the hair around there. Yeah. Looks like he's been flanked a little bit. They whooped around there in the back. And when the dog unloads, how far away do you go? Well, if the dog keeps barking and growling, you go clear back into the blind. But as soon as you hear him quit, you stop and look. You don't after him anymore, and you go back again. So eventually, we're going to teach him the whole time he sees you to keep coming after you. Don't don't unload and say, okay, he's gone, I can relax now. Try to keep him on his toes a little bit. So with him, let's try doing that. Next time he unloads, just kind of spin around and stop and come back on it.
Charger, charger, You line up on something, you've got to have always two objects to line up on. And if somebody thinks they can do fine with one object, then let you do that today and see how it works for you. But if you were walking, let's say, to a tree here, they discovered in World War II, they have a thing in the air aircraft back then called ADF, which was a, a needle, a little instrument and it would point at what they call a low frequency radio station like a broadcasting station okay now if if the plane was going to fly to that broadcasting station if he was pointed at this station the plane would look just like that okay they discovered that if, if the wind was blowing this direction what would happen is the plane would as he was going, he would get in what they call a crab, which was like that. And to fly from here to the station, he would go like this. Okay? So he'd always be pointed at the station, no matter where he was, all the way like that. He's constantly flying to the station, but because the wind is blowing him off. Well, when you're tracking a dog and you're trying to walk a straight line, and you go into one object, you do exactly the same thing. You start out and you say, okay, here I'm pointed at the object, here I'm pointed at the object, here I'm pointing at the object. No matter where you are, you're always pointed at the object. To, to track a dog this way would be almost like going out and trying to shoot a gun with just one side on it. Okay? It'd be very hard to hit something. There's a difference between a rifle and a pistol almost, even though a pistol has two sides just like a rifle does. So what we want to do instead, in order to line it up, we want to always find two different objects to line up on. Let's say that we have the tree right here, and we had a clump of grass right there, okay? The only time, in the old geometric principle about Three points make a circle unless they're in a straight line, okay? We're going to make them always be in a straight line. So the only way this and this can line up is if you're here or somewhere along that kind of not too straight line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Leading to the Hebrew. Yeah. 
Yeah. Leading to the clump of grass. Okay? Now, the other thing that we realize is that once you get to that clump of grass, or before, you must turn. Okay, now, a clump of grass makes a particularly nice thing because you can say, that will be my turn. So not only do you have a perfect lineup as you're walking out there, but when it comes time to make that turn, you can make your turn. Now, the problems begin here. Now, what are you going to line up on? Well, you know this point. Now, this is a for sure. Just like this was down here because you stuck a, a tracking stake in the ground, or we gave you the little flags with your tracking back against it. So you know where you were here, and therefore that's going to be the same, okay? If you couldn't find this place for some reason, you can always find the lineup again if, if these two objects are something that you remember well enough. But when you get out here and you make this turn, you've got a problem because you don't know what you're going to line up on. Okay. Question arises, everybody always asks it, what is more important, marking this clump of grass where the turn is, are finding something over here to line up on. You're going to have to make that decision yourself. As an example, there's a fence post right here, and there's a, a big light standard off in the distance right here. As you're laying by this track, you're lucky to the right because you know you want to turn right, and you get here and you see those things, and you say, wow, that, that's lined up just perfect. Okay, you go ahead and turn here. That means you know where this leg is going to be. You've got that now marked real well. But it's real important in doing turns that you know where the turn is so if the dog goes past it, you can give him a fraction. So how do you remember where your turn is? Especially if you're 6, 8, 10, 20, 30 feet behind the dog. You're way here when the dog is at the turn and you can't see your line up. Again, you got a problem in that situation, even though you can find the track. For me, I would rather have a definite object on the ground that I can line up with and, and that I can turn on, and then question, can I stop? In other words, can I walk up, most people do, and I say, okay, I'm turning here, and they'll stand here, and they'll look, and they'll walk, and they'll go back and forth, and what are you doing to the scent right there where you stop? You're making it real obvious to the dog that something's going on right here, and you're making it a little too easy for the dog to find that turn and too easy to stop, or in some cases, there's so much scent there, a lot of dogs actually lay down if it's a good article dog. Especially for some of you that have a, a dog that's already trained to shift some three, you say, why does he lie down on the turn? That's why, because he stopped there. Okay, so what you do is you say, here, I'm going to turn at this spot on the ground. You turn. You don't know where you're going, but walk a few feet, okay? Walk maybe six steps. Then stop if you've got to stop and look. Or if you want to, if you've got a lineup, even a better idea, you have your two objects over here. You say, okay, I'm going to turn on that. You turn there without having anything on the ground. You want to make sure of your lineup. What if you dropped an article right there? Would that hurt anything? Not really. In fact, it's a good motivation for the dog after he makes the turn, isn't it? Because he's going to make his turn, he's going to go a few steps, he's going to lie down, he's going to find an article, he can fed at the article, you get to take a break, and you get to stop for a while and make sure that your lineup is right. So you've bought yourself some time. Now, with all things with dog training, you don't want to do the same thing the same way every time. So what I'm trying to do is give you enough alternatives that you can use. So that would be a, a time that you could save that problem simply by laying an article. Okay. Now instead, we go up back up to our clump of grass, we turn, we walk six feet, and we stop. Okay. Again, if you wanted to, you could put an article. My rule is if I got an object to turn on, I won't drop an article. And in my case, I've done it enough, I don't have to stop. And as you get better, you won't have to stop either. Okay, now you walk on up, you slow down, you stop if you have to, you find your objects over here that you're going to line up on, 
They may not be as good as your first lineup. This one may be a darker tree and a little bush in front of it, or it may be a TV tower way off in the dim distance and a telephone pole. I mean, it could be whatever you can find out there that you can work on, okay? Now, you're going to be walking this way. Again, as you walk, you're looking at the ground. Look for a beer can, a strange rock, a stick. Look for anything that you can find that's laying out there on the ground that's going to tell you that here's another turn. Okay? You go on up here. You make your, you see a, a stick laying here. You make your turns. You go this direction. You want to confirm it. Put an article. Make sure you've got your line up this way. You go down here. Now, as you're walking this way, you're going to get ready to come this way or this way, and you can start looking now again for an object to line up on, or two objects to line up on. Okay. Everybody have yeah. I have a question. Uh, if you look at Tronic, some books on tracking. They tell you that it, it, for a beginning dog, it's okay to double or triple away the turn for the first time. What, what's your philosophy? Okay, let, let me get past okay. that shall land this and we'll go Okay, because that reminded me when you said don't stop the turn. Okay, too much okay. yeah, go ahead and think about that and then we can remember it. Okay. Any other questions on this? If every class is the same. Everybody says, hey, there's nothing else. No problem. Hey, no, 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 I just don't get in the mud. That's why I'm going to put the bridge in the bus. I was thinking this morning, thank goodness for the rain. I looked at them tracks. I was just raining while he was laying it. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to have you do this morning is land the tracks. We'll talk a little bit, look up the sky, whatever, and then, then we'll let you run the tracks without your dog. So we want to see how well you can find the tracks. Because there's no point in you going out and laying the track that you can't find. I've seen more good dogs get run by people that were trying to make their dog track where there was no track than any other reason for her good dog to the track. Okay. Now, just for a few minutes, let's talk a little bit about the fundamentals of actually working a dog with this, but we're not actually going to do dogs today. We'll start with that tomorrow. Okay. How are you going to lay your track? Okay. The way you should lay a track is don't do this. Okay. Reason is, is just one isolated example. We used to have a person in our club that was a very competitive type of person. He trained, did an excellent job of training his dog, and he always laid his tracks like that. He got through Schutz and One with 100 points on his track. Did an excellent job on Schutz and One. He got to Schutz and Two. He was very confident. We went all the way to, to Florida for a championship. He was in Schutz and Two. So a real good chance of winning it. His dog failed the shifts into track. Act like there was no track there. It was an easy track. I mean, it was early in the morning with a lot of good grass. There's no reason that he should have had a problem. But the dog did and did not pass the track. Okay. Question is why? Well, track winner laid the track like that. He always did it like that, and that creates more of a ground disturbance. Okay. What's the ground disturbance? What's the dog tracking? I showed in a TBX track. Uh, trial not too long ago, and to give you an idea as to how confused people are about what dogs are tracking, they were out at 6 o'clock the night before with a bunch of people wandering around the area that they were going to track. In other words, they're mapping out what you're going to turn on, where you're going to turn. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh, okay. I think that's Bob. You didn't get one of these, did you? Yeah, no. Okay, yeah, no. Okay. That's the last of them that are made up. You need to order them. Okay. And I'm gone. Okay. And that is what the dog is tracking on. They went out there and they took three people and they walked and they said, here's a tree and we're going to make that turn tomorrow morning. We're going to make that here. We're going to walk this way for a little while. We're going to go through this ravine and under this fallen tree right here. And they're they're deciding where that track is going to be. And as they go along, they put a stake here so they, they know that they can find it the next day. So the track layer, and then as she lays the track, she's got to pick up the flags and so forth. Then the next morning, this one lady, who was not apparently present when they went out and decided where they were going to lay the track, 
she, with her own unique scent, is going to go out and lay this track. And there's no worry about all those people walking around there the night before because that's not the one the dog's going to be tracking. She's, the, he's going to be tracking this lady, okay? Now, somebody tell me, what assumption are they making there? The lady goes no, no, the, the, it's the lady scent. They're making the, the assumption that the dog is tracking a human mm -hmm. scent. Not a ground disturbance like I just talked about shuffling the feet. How long is the animal still? Okay, they, they told me they were still out there at 6.30 the night before. No, no, but how long was between when the track is laid by the lady and when you have to run? It's three to five hours. Okay, that's yeah. long enough. Oh, that's what we thought. But anyway, what happened is they just assumed that it was for sure going to be the human scent. In fact, the track went across a lot of bear dirt for the woods, gullies. I mean, anybody's ever seen a TDX track knows what I'm talking about. Very difficult. Okay, the dog went out to run the track and actually ran the track, went down on an article, and they blew the whistle that told me it was finished, that I had gotten off the track. And I said, how can I be off the track? My dog got an article, he made a parent. He said, well, he cut off the whole area. Well, it was an area where nobody would walk. And as I later found out, the rest of the people walked around this way while this track layer, in fact, did go this way. But what had happened here is my dog wasn't tracking the track layer's scent. My dog was tracking a crushed vegetation scent. Is everybody following in my line of discussion right now? Is it a little bit more than... Okay, let me know. But the dog was not tracking what they thought the dog was tracking. They even go so far as to leave an article of clothing from the track bar up here so my dog can take scent on it. Okay? Like a bloodhound. Like a bloodhound, yeah. Okay. And then we have to go through into this track. Okay. I have gone out as a train method or practice and I, sometimes during the summer I'll go out and lay a track at 8 o'clock at night when we're out to dinner or we're on our way someplace. I go out and lay this track then the next morning I'll get up at 7 or so and I go out and I run that track at 7.30. I discovered an interesting thing. The dog can almost always do that track even though it's really several hours old because the track is not that old as far as what the dog is thinking at that point. On the other hand, if I go out and lay a track at 12 noon on a 90 degree day and run it at 1 o'clock, a lot of times my dog cannot find it because of the aging of the track. Okay, so there's a lot of things at play here and what had in fact happened is my dog was probably following the greatest proponents of tracking where all those people had walked, where the majority had been from the night before and actually walked around when when the tracker actually cut through that way and put an article here. My dog made the turn and found the article. Okay, they said, well, you train your dog wrong. Well, think about how you're training your dog. When you teach your dog from the beginning to track, let's say you go out in a field, and it just so happens the wind's blowing this way. <clears throat> you lay your track this way with a turn, <clears throat> and you go out and run the track. Is, you think that that's conducive to teaching your dog to find your scent? You run it immediately after you lay it? Two hours after you lay it. What's happening? If he's finding your scent, and the wind's blowing this way, and you're going this way, you're at the end of the line holding the dog, and he's tracking you, right? Supposed to be. But all that scent from you is blowing right at him anyway. You understand? So if anything, we're proof training the dog not to find our human scent, aren't we? You mean you're behind him, so your scent's blowing up into his face all the time, so right. in front of him. The whole time you're tracking, the whole time you're walking on the line. Yeah. So does that mean if he was tracking a person, he could turn back into when he come back to the source? Am I missing something? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, you're saying that the wind's on your back. And okay. You're tracking 30 feet behind. And if he was tracking everything, oh, yeah. he would have the ability to yeah. Yeah. turn and come right up with you. Sure. 
Yeah. That's okay. Like now, you find the source of smoke or whatever, you know, he's going to go mm -hmm. right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Tom, you, you're talking about this particular type of tracking for shits and work, right? Right. Well, I, it's interesting because it blends in exactly to the same type of thing that you're doing. Because it's tracking is tracking, you know. Right. But it. But you think, you say that there's no, that the dog is, you know, you teach them tracking, but crush vegetation is not tracking a man's scent. Not necessarily. I'm saying the way we teach our dogs to track, most of us in children, does not ever teach the dog to track for a human scent. As opposed to blood now, 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 to try, uh, try to track human scent. Right. Well, in, 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 in my, you know, what we do, when we track dogs like that too, you know, I'm not saying there's nothing, anything wrong with it. Yeah. But if I go out and a man has jumped out of the car right here and there's been other people there, he has got to know what scent he's got to get on. He just can't go out there and jump out and crush vegetation, not knowing what time he hit the ground. Okay. And let's, okay, let's get into that a little bit. Okay. Uh, the, I worked with a guy uh, up in Chicago several years ago. There was some military people that did a whole lot of testing. There's a lot of information out available on tests that were done 20 years ago. They used to be classified when they lay a track and burn a field and have the dogs still track across the field and so forth. And some things are, are real interesting as far as training a dog from the beginning specifically to track a human. Okay. Number one, a human is like a Roman candle. I'm standing here and I'm warmer than the air around me. So therefore, that they've got pictures again showing this, that my scent, uh, what do they call it? Uh, Aurora. Spores, what are they? Aurora. Well, but one of those little slivers of skin, you probably know. Spores? Uh -huh. yeah. No. Rick, rats? Yeah, okay. Anyway, they're coming off. <laughs> and they're hitting the ground, and they're spreading out all around me. To where I don't have a track that's just right here. Right. I've got a track that maybe as wide as this room is. We'll show you on a minute a little piece of video done with smoke. That scent is drifting all over, depending on where the, the wind is blowing. So scent is everywhere. So for a dog to say, he walked right here, it would be an impossibility. Because if anything, there might be less scent there than there would be over here next to me. Okay? So for a dog to track a human scent, you're going to get a totally different type of tracker. A dog tracking human scent is going to probably be doing a lot of that. He's going to be doing what we're talking about. Right. He's going to go out and he's going to find where it ends over here. He's going to where it ends over here. Okay. Let, let me put that tape on this room. I think you guys are enjoy this. I should have had it out. I hadn't planned on getting into all this this morning, but since it was raining when I walked in, I thought it would give it, it's supposed to clear up, I thought it would give it just a little chance to do so. We find a human scent. We've got to get him interested in the human. We really don't want his nose all the way down the ground like some of you might have heard. We're teaching a dog to do what we call trailing in that case. Number one, you don't ever lay that track for your dog. You can't. How could you lay the track for your own dog and expect him to go out and find you when you're going to be hanging on the end of the leaf? Or when the dog lives with you? Okay, I had at one point even had Linda make up some scent, a, a chemical uh, for a fear scent and for and people. We found that if if you're tracking somebody that's afraid, your dog does it a whole lot better, I'm sure you've seen that, a uh, whole lot better than if the person's not afraid because he's given off a very distinctive odor. The same sort of thing a dog would encounter in the wild when he's on a hot chase with a rabbit or a deer or yeah. any animal that's afraid. The dog works even better when he's got close enough to scare that animal than he did when he's just passively tracking. So if you're tracking an escape following the person's really ripe, it's going to really make a smell that that dog can find. So in training the dog for doing that, a lot of times, will make the reward for the dog actually be an agitator. Will actually give them the bite. But we're not looking for a dog to stick his nose down on the ground and go. And there was an article that Phil Holster did with, I believe it was 2020, we got a copy of the tape. I don't know how many of you saw it. It was a, a real joke, this guy. He was out there uh tracking across concrete and all kinds of stuff six months old yeah months. yeah pressed Very pressed. yeah now you think that could happen <laughs> when you saw that smoke you know they just but dogs can track on concrete and i have seen them track our old tracks on concrete but again they're tracking the human scent okay it's something already 
altogether different. So the way I train my dog to track and get 100 points in FH and 100 points several times in just in three, and the way that dog needed to track to go out and do a TDX is different. Okay, he needed to do that particular track. He would have been better off to not be tracking but be trailing. For the TDX. Is yeah, that typical with TDX or just that particular? Track? Yeah, that's the way the rules are right now. They're giving some real flack because it has to turn up and only like three or four percent of the dogs are ever passing. You know, and those do it twenty times before they finally pass one. Tom, if you read if you read Johnson's book, of course he's Canadian, he mm -hmm. talks about training for TDX all the time. And man, talk about somebody that that emphasizes not it, you know, avoiding air and all that stuff. Boy, he means real we need nutrition tracking. Yeah. It's, so it must be different in Canada. No, it's, well, it's the same. And but that's probably not a very good example. Yeah. A lot of controversy way that they're judging this thing and the way they're setting this track. Because stop and think, again, just a, a, a reasonable individual can figure out that you can't go out there and walk the night before all over where this track is going to be and then expect that dog to go out and follow only one person that walks it the next day, unless you just get lucky and the person happens to get on that, that track. Now, my dog can tell the difference between tracks. He won't take a cross track and so forth. But to have cross tracks that are just constantly doing this, who's to say he's not going to actually pick up one because it's going to bring him right back in? And he, you know, and I don't know that much about how a dog tracks to tell you what he's smelling or what he's doing up there, but I, I can see how I can very easily get confused with it. He went down and did 100 point FH, which was the same age over the same type of terrain, actually in two different places going through water that was up to my knees and half as wide as this room. And he could do that all right, but nobody walked out there except the track lamp. Mm -hmm. So in Schutzen, what we're doing is we want the dog to track where you walk on the ground. We want him to follow a specific set on the ground. And we're going to train this dog differently than we would train a dog that we are trying to train to find the human scent, like we're talking about with Curtis, the dog that you can go out and chase down prisoners with. Now, you can later switch him over if you want to. But we, we specifically want to teach the dog to follow the trail. Let me show you one other example that I think is kind of interesting. Let's say that you've got, a, again, a, a wooded area across here. The scent, the, the wind is blowing like this through the trees. And there's a highway right here. There's a highway right here. And there's a car park right here that apparently it's suspected that this guy robbed the place, they followed him to here, and the car was found, okay? Something over here, he can't go this way. So they said, we want you to go out and track in this area and find this guy for us. We know he's out there someplace. This happened out in southern Missouri about a year ago, same kind of thing. You've got a dog that's trained to track human sin. Where are you going to start? At the car. Okay, if you know he's out there. Train to track human sin? Yeah. Start on this side of the field. Over here? Yeah. Okay, that's what I did. And what I would do, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even do anything like tracking. What I would do is the same Air thing as model noise, Mark. Air yeah. yeah. I would go out and I, I'd send that dog. I cast him all the way out here, and when it get out of reach, I call him back, send him all the way over here, all even down the road. All he's got to do is pick up that scent. The wind is blowing in your direction. And what's he going to do? He's going to cut and go this way. And it's something we won't get into, but with police work, we'll do the same thing in a big open field, like the, the field we were going to go to. We're going to go to a different one today. But we'll go out, we'll drop something out in that field, you know, a stash of marijuana or a gun or whatever. And I can go out there in five minutes, we can find that gun by casting the dog back and forth until he picks up that scent as it blows to him from the downwind part. Okay? Now, like Curtis said, in some cases, if you could pick up the guy's scent, let's say he, his, his track looks something like this. It, it, nobody ever walks straight. If you're right-handed, you're going to tend to walk in a right-handed circle. If you're left, you're going to tend to walk in the left. And you get somebody out in the woods, usually they're just purely going in circles. So he goes out and he starts tracking. What's the dog going to do when he gets here? He's going to go that way, isn't he? He's going to cut off. Okay. Yeah. Now, the only reason I'm going into this, and he's still going to get the guy. 
It's a matter of which way is quicker, but both will work. Now, the only reason I'm even bothering to screw your minds up with this is, number one, I want to point out the difference between the two. Because in Chinson, you always run into people that say, I've got a good tracking dog in a situation like you're talking about, where he's actually proven himself several times. And you take him out for shifting and the dog doesn't appear to be tracking. And you say, well, that, that dog can't track. Or they watch yours and say, well, that doesn't look like what I've seen. There's, you've got to understand there's a lot of different ways to do this. And for Schutzen, it's important that the dog walks exactly where the guy walks, turns where the guy turns, doesn't go past, doesn't circle, doesn't fringe. He's got to be right on it. The other thing we know about Schutzen is it's always going to be on grass or dirt. It's not going to be through the woods. It's not going to be across a gravel uh, driveway. It's not going to, it may cross a road, but that's about as much as it's going to do as far as the hard surface is going to do. So we deal with what we know we've got to teach the dog to do the best to be competitive on that type of a surface. So when we lay our tracks, we're going to be walking probably in grass or dirt. And to begin with, we're going to lay the track like this, taking small steps all the way. We may be dropping food as we go to give the dog the motivation. We're going to lay the track ourselves and then we're going to run it with our dog. So we're teaching the dog to follow what? Ground disturbance. Yeah, ground disturbance. Brush vegetation. Uh -huh. Now, some dogs will actually begin to find food. I've got a giant snouser that I train. As long as the food was there, you could swear he was tracking to take the food up. And he couldn't track. You couldn't, he couldn't switch. All he could do is find food. In fact, the wind changed, he was in great trouble. But if he was going into the wind and there was food on there, he tracked his plant. <coughs> if you use food, you're going to always encounter that problem. You're going to, that's something you have to deal with. Usually when you start making turns, that takes care of itself right there. But that's exactly right. He's, he's going to fall that crushed vegetation. So when you make your turn, then you, you walk up and you make your turn. When you do that, the dog has to find the fact that the turn began here, or the track ended here. Notice what we call track loss, and then be able to search left and right until it finds which way it goes and goes without spinning. Just stand there and look both ways and then go that way. That's the only way he's going to be able to do that and get a high score. Okay, now Linda asked a question about double lane track. Double lane would mean that Beginning with a dog, I walk out this way, and I turn around and walk this way. That would be double lane. Triple lane would be like if I go out here and I make this turn, I go out here, I go back again, and then I go back out again. That would be three times. Okay, why would we do that? Make it easier in the turn, there's more scent there, we can follow it rather than go on. More question. So the dog is more likely to give us track loss, isn't it? If you double or triple lane the turn. So it would be a very good thing to do in teaching the dog to make it easier for the dog. We get into, we get a lot, I'm, I know I'm rambling pretty bad, but we get into a lot of discussion when you want to make it harder, what's easier, or what's harder for the dog. But at the beginning, when we're just starting, starting to, to do turns, we want to make finding that turn for your dog as easy as it possibly can be. So you can learn what it's about in an easy situation and we can make it harder. So triple lane, double lane, anything that you could do like that would very definitely be. What do you do? Normally what I'll do is is the double or triple lane, because it's, it's impossible to double lane, you know, if you're out on the track and turn. If you just lay in a straight line, you can double lane. But I'll generally triple lane like that, go back and forth and then walk on. You mean just with the area of the turn, you don't mean the whole track. Right, yeah. The rest of the track I'll walk like this. Very quickly. I'm always in a hurry when I go tracking and I may have four or five dogs with me. So a lot of, it, it doesn't take me long until I'm walking like that on the track. I mean, I'm really moving out. And I want to get that track in, <clears throat> get it aging, and, and get the dog. And I find that's a huge advantage once the dog can do that because nobody's ever going to lay a track like that in a trial. So if my dog can follow that practice, my dog typically does worse in practice than in the trial. And I think that's the reason. But again, that's a much harder situation, so we're going to wait for that. Okay, just quickly to go through a couple things, and we're going to try to use up about an hour before we move on to do our tracking. Let's talk about conditions of the track. How do you have that outline? Yeah. 
Now let me go through and we'll just list a few things that have somebody tell me. Is the track going to age faster on a hot or a cool day? Hot. Hot day. Okay. So, hard. Easy would be cool or cold and this hard would be a hot day. Okay. Uh, is the track going to be more or less difficult to run on a windy day or not so windy day? Not so windy. Okay, so hard would be windy <laughs> and easy would be calm. Okay, what about humidity? Anybody care to guess on that one? It's a little harder. High humidity and easy. Okay. Keep to the ground. Okay, so there, any questions about humidity? Okay. Okay, what time of day would be easiest? Morning. Early in the morning. Okay, uh, so explain to me why. Because it's damp and cool, generally in the morning time. Okay. Got more. Uh, Sun? No. It hasn't been on the Okay, as the day progresses, convection takes place right. and all your sense starts going up. Right, starts rising. Then you got to get a, a crop duster and spray the tree. <laughs> 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 now, why, why do you think it was so easy for my dog to track the tracks that I laid at night and ran the next morning? Then? Because, because of the dew, it wasn't hot, and the dew kept it whole hell of scent to the ground. Because at night, the air goes down, and the day, the air goes up. If you ever notice you fly someplace, you fly during the day, it's real bumpy, and you've got a night flight, one of those cheap ones at midnight or whatever, it's nice and smooth, okay? Because the air is descending, so it's all settling back down, it goes crazy and comes back up. That's why you see morning thunderstorms and after, late afternoon thunderstorms, it's the same reason, because the weather's changing and it's causing turbulence. Okay, so next would be uh, ground cover. What type of ground cover would be easiest? Uh, with high grass or low grass be better? Low grass. Huh? Low. For tracking? Yeah. For tracking be low grass, be better than high grass. What do you mean by high grass though? Okay. Yeah, okay, with grass, we'll say this tall be easier to track in and it's equally as thick, but cut grass has not been recently cut, but just shorter grass like this. Which do you think would be easier for the be Huh? Shorter. Be I think maybe the taller might be easier because there's more crushed stuff laying over the taller. Okay, and what we find stuff what we find in the taller grass is that the scent stays longer. You saw us fogging there with that machine. If we could have fogged and grass that long, you would have seen that smoke still hiding in there uh, even ten minutes later at some spot. It just sits there forever. So Basically, the higher the grass to a point, the easier it's going to be because it's going to retain the scent. So doesn't that make it harder for, you know, doesn't the dog have a tendency then to come up with his nose? Yeah. I was going to ask that same question. Yeah. If you track too much in like right. tall rye, the dog will start going yeah. 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 higher. Yeah. He won't. He don't have to, but have more slant there, he doesn't have to put his nose down and search for the track. So he would not, he would lose points. Yeah, but you're talking about beginning easy. Yeah, I'm talking about this training. Yeah, and again, any training method that you use, remember, you can't do the same. This is just a, another Murphy's law. You can't do the same thing all the time. You, it, you, you need to, to constantly be Change. inventing different situations and changing things on the dog. But basically speaking, high grass is going to be easier than low. Also easier to see the track. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, one of the, I don't know the answer to, but just get your own opinion. What do you think about dirt versus grass? I know you've worked on dirt. You don't have much else. Sure. Yeah, okay. okay. Anybody else tracked on dirt? Okay. Well, I've been tracked. I've started my dogs on dirt because we have okay. some plowed fields near the. The thing that we found is I would, again, I would have to 
list dirt over here and grass over here. Why? Because in dirt, the footprint. It, it's a real easy, the, apparently the number of cents that are involved are very small. And you don't, you're not going to run into an onion patch or a clover patch or changes of color. It's going to be just the one smell. Do you ever notice that if uh, they're digging a basement for a house and you eat, that you can even smell that smell of that disturbed dirt? Or the, or the farmer's out plowing his field, boy, you can smell that earth. And I think what happens when you get out and you're walking and you're doing anything in that dirt, you're maybe kicking it every now and then, you're disturbing that dirt, make something extremely easy for the dog to find. I think it depends on the weather conditions, because I've noticed that it's, if, uh, it's Especially with the local moisture contains weekend. Yeah. Do you like to start off with all in the uh, field? Yeah, yeah, I found the grass. Yeah, now, again, I get to diverging too much from the subject, but what I have found is very important when you first start tracking a dog to make things easy. You don't want to make it hard. You want to double lay your track. You want to make it, a, that's why I'm going through this, really, to end up with that. I want you to know when I say make it easy, you're doing all these things and you're staying away from all these things, okay? So you make it real easy. For me, if I say dirt is better than grass and I'll eliminate high grass, okay? I look for a cool, calm day. I look for, you know, higher humidity situation and lower humidity. I make sure I went out in the morning and uh, I, I would just do everything I possibly could to put things together to make it as easy for the dog as possible. And dirt would really be one of them. Have you ever, have you ever uh, tracked in snow? Yeah. yeah. We've done a lot of tracking in snow. In fact, we'll get into the use of the blindfold this, this week and that's why we developed the blindfold. Because we found because they, they can see the track. Yeah, we found that boy they would learn. But you yeah. know it's funny they don't seem to do that in dirt. And I don't know if contrast in the dog. I don't know if they have trouble seeing contrast with their eyes. I don't know what it might be. But for some reason you take a dog out tracking three times the snow and you got a hundred percent track no matter what. Mm -hmm. You take a dog out you track him twenty times in dirt, and he still doesn't seem to be watching his track. Do it almost have to. No. I mean, I talked to a lot of people about tracking in snow, and they said they won't even track in snow because the dog, I mean, gets used to seeing the track. So you don't have to at that point blindfold the dog. I, I, I do maybe 10 tracks a year with a dog in snow, and if we've got a situation where we've got snow on the ground for two months, I'll just finally quit tracking because I, with the blindfold, even I can do a little bit. The other thing is, uh, Glenn Johnson that she mentioned a minute ago came up with some deal about it aging in snow was so much slower because it was cold and you didn't have convection. Right. And he said it was so much easier for dogs to find scent lines too. So you not only able to see the the footprints but finding the scent you never challenged. So, so yeah, so it's it's just too much easier too much so much easier at that point. Yeah, once you got a hundred percent track or on snow with a blindfold, you might as well quit because yeah. you 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 need to go to a harder level. But, but you, you can still you would still track the dog in snow just to get me into a different condition. Yeah. Because you, you will run into that occasionally in trial. Currently. Yeah. No, I don't know. Okay, Alice? Yeah, I was just going to say, I noticed with Blanca that you know, she was learned how to track on grass, okay? All of her life she tracked on grass. And then when we realized we were going to have to do some elimination trials in Florida and we had to go to dirt, plus Germany was going to be dirt, we started tracking her on dirt. And she got hysterical the first couple of times. What is this? I don't know how to track on this, you know, all that time. Once she learned how to do it, she now tracks dirt much better than she does grass. Mm -hmm. And if I only tracked her on dirt, I'd have a hell of a time on grass. Mm -hmm. She should track the dirt better. Just like it goes back, you need to change up the dirt thing, too. She will use her eyes on the dirt. Yeah. Well, it works. So check it out. Okay, so what we're, what you've got to be able to do is to begin to relate. And what are, there you might know, what, what have I missed here? What are some other, anybody else think of some conditions that we've, we've missed? Wind direction. During rain. Okay. Wow. About rain, heavy rain. Yeah, okay, that, that's a good one. Um, if you lay a track and it rains on the track, it's going to be more difficult to find it than if it hadn't rained. We found out if we've had a day like the day where it has rained, and then you lay the track and it doesn't rain, and then you run the track, it's easier to do. But it seems I had a...